فؤادك الايام فتا فصل الاصول الاصول في اوامر الكتاب والسنه انها للوجوب الا اذا دل الدليل على الاستحباب او الاباح the sheikh in the fifth fasl we're in right now the fifth chapter the sheikh he's talking about usul um fundamental matters yadarru ilayha al faqih that the person who is a faqih is in need of these are things that you need if you're a faqih you need to understand these issues so he says the first thing is annaha lil wujub the commands of allah the awamir the commands that come from allah the asal and the commands that come from the messenger the asal is annaha lil wujub that it is obligatory that's the asal if allah commands something it shows obligation if the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam commands something it shows obligation so what does awamir mean first of all you need to know awamir is plural and the singular is amr the singular is amr amr means huwa istida'u al-fi'l bil qawl ala wajh al-istila so first of all is what it is um a person he calls you by way of utterance he by way of utterance he tells you to do a particular action so he requests from you an action but he's using ver- he's using he's doing it by way of verbally ala wajh al istila and he's a person who's higher level of you because if somebody who is low t- commands a person who's high this is not called amr it's called dua it's called supplication it's called amr sual asking it's not called amr it's called sual asking naam So the Sheikh is saying that if Allah commands something and the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam commands something it shows obligation and that we have to do it um, and that we also we have to we have to do it then the Sheikh goes on to saying illa idha dalla dalil unless if the evidence shows that that command is recommended Unless the evidence shows that it's recommended. Now, before I go into that point, how many forms does the awamir occur? How many siyag? How many ways, methods does a command occur? I'm going to, only going to mention four. Four ways is when a command occurs from the kitab or the sunnah. One is well known as a fi'l amr. If al do, as Allah Taala Ta Ta He said, "Aqim al-salat," establish the prayer. Surah al-Salat, ayah 87. Establish the prayer. It's a fi'l amr. If al do, it's a command. It's a verb. You're told to do this. So it comes in the wazan of what? If al. The second one is that which is a ma yakunu fi'l al mudari an masbuq an bilam. A fi'l mudari which a lam which is a lam al amr goes before it. Where Allah Tabarak wa Taala He says, which He said in Surah Al Hajj, Ayah 29, "Wal yatawafu bil bait al atiq." Do tawaf around the Kaaba. The lamb here is lamb amr. Do tawaf around the Kaaba. So we have a fi'l mudari', we have a present verb. Okay? And before that fi'l mudari', we have a lamb amr. The third form it comes in which is what? Ism fi'l amr. It occurs in a what? It occurs in a ism fi'l amr. And we studied in our sharh of qatrun nada wa ballu sada. We took what a ism fi'l amr is. And I'm going to quickly sum it up for you. A fi'l, amr, a verb, which is called a verb, which is a command. It has two things. The first thing is that dalalatuhu ala talab. It has to indicate that something you're requested to do. Wa qabulihi ya al muqatabah, and that it accepts ya al muqatabah. The feminine. I can speak to a woman. For example, for example. I say قم. If I want, I can speak to a woman. It's a fi'l amr. Qu mi. I say to the girl. Qum is to a male, and a girl you say qu mi. Stand. So does it show a request? هل يدل على الطلب? Does it show a request? The answer is yes. Does it also accept a ya 
المخاطبه yes it does with those two present simultaneously this is called a fi'l amr if it doesn't accept a ya al muannathati al mukhatabah if it refuses but it does show a it does show a request it does show a request but it doesn't accept ya al muannathati al mukhatabah what is this called ismu fi'l amr ismu fi'l amr this is called what uh, na'am um, like the word sah ma you can never put those words into what you can never ever put those sah and ma you can never say you can never put ayya al muannath al mukhatabah and it also shows a command be quiet sah it shows talab but it doesn't accept ya al muannath al mukhatabah the example for that one is walillahi ala nasi hijju al bayt man istata'a ilayhi sabila the fourth one inshallah ta'ala is the fourth one is um, that the Amr وَقَدْ يَكُونُ الْأَمْرُ بِسِيغَةِ الْأَمْرِ الصَّرِيحَةِ كَمَا فِي قَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى That the word Amr, the word itself is brought into the ayah. The word Amr is clear cut, it's in the verse. Such as what Allah said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ Allah orders you. بِالْعَدْلِ So the word Amr is present in the ayah. Um, so this, the ulama, the majority of the scholars, the jumhur of the ulama, what do they take? That the awamir, تدل على الوجوب بنفسها. In and within itself, it shows obligation. If Allah تبارك وتعالى tells you to do something, if the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم tells you to do something, you have to follow it. Now somebody may ask you, what is the delil? What's the evidence that the commands that come from Allah and His Messenger they show obligation? Where's the evidence for that? You say this to them. قال تعالى الله سبحانه سورة الحزاب آية 36. وما كان لمؤمن ولا مؤمنة إذا قضى الله ورسوله أمرا أن يكون لهم خيرة من أمرهم. It is not befitting for a male or a female, believing man or a believing woman. After Allah and His Messenger have passed a rule, they've judged a matter, they've given a, their words in this matter, you have no choice after it. I mean, it's obligatory, you have to do it. You have no choice. So the asal of a amar from the kitab or the sunnah, it shows obligation. The other ayah, in the ending of Surah An-Nur, Allah wa Ta'ala, He says, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He says, um, he says, فَلِيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَن تُصِيبَهُمْ فِتْنَةٌ أَوْ يُصِيبَهُمْ أَوْ يُصِيبَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ So it's very serious. It is very serious. Um, but there could come a what? A delil may indicate. A delil what? A evidence may indicate what? A evidence may indicate that this command that came from Allah and His Messenger are what? They're not obligatory. And that is recommended. An example for that would be, for example, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, "Sallu qabl al maghrib, pray before maghrib." And then he said it again, "Sallu qabl al maghribi, pray before maghrib." Now, "Sallu" is a fi'l amr. It's a command. Does that show obligation? Naam. Do we have to follow it? Yes. Do we have cho any choice? No. But there came a sarif. Sarif means. Something that diverted this command, sallu, something diverted it. What diverted it? Within the hadith, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa on the third time when he kept saying, sallu, sallu qabla al-maghribi, sallu qabla al-maghribi, sallu qabla, sallu qabla salat al-maghribi, sallu, he said it, said it said, on the third time, what did he say? Liman sha'a, whoever wants. Now, liman sha'a is what the Sheikh is referring to. Da illa idha dalla dalilu. Evidence here showed that it's recommended because I was given my choice. I was given a what? A choice. So if the, the fact that the, the Prophet said, Sallu qabla al qab, sallu, sallu pray, qabla salat al maghrib. Pray before salat al maghrib. Sallu qabla salat al maghrib. And then on the third attempt, what did he say? Sallu qabla salat al maghrib. Liman sha'a, whoever wishes. Or whoever wants to. So this shows what? So here what you say is الأمر تقتضي الوجوب ما لم يأتي قرينة تصرف عن الوجوب إلى الندب So here came what? A evidence that diverted from obligation to what? That is recommended. نعم. والأصل في النواهي Sorry, I forgot the part which is أو الإباحة Sometimes evidence comes and it diverts. So we have obligation. Allah is message to command something. 
So if Allah and His Messenger command something, eh? Allah and His Messenger command something, what does it show? In its original essence, obligation. Evidence can come and it can divert it to one of two, that command. Either istihbab that is recommended or ibaha, that is mubah. This command, this amr, either can be istihbab or it can be ibaha. I gave an example for istihbab, now I'm going to give an example for the ibaha. The ibaha is, um, this I want you to understand this is very important. Um, if a matter used to be mubah originally, it used to be mubah before. The sharia came and it prohibited it for a short period of time. What did it do? It prohibited it for a period of time. Pay attention. This qa'ida you need to really understand very well. A matter used to be mubah. The sharia came and that mubah thing, what did it do to it? It prohibited it for a period of time. And then after, it commanded you to do it. This command is not, it's not obligation, nor is it istihbab. It is mubah because it goes back to what it used to be, which is that it was mubah. Give you an example. Allah Tabarakwa Ta'ala, He said, لا تقتل الصيد وأنتم حرم. Don't hunt whilst you're in a state of ihram. Now, hunting in its original essence was what? Mubah. Hunting in its original essence used to be what? It used to be Mubah. The Sharia came and what did it say to you? I mean, the Sharia came and what did it say to you? It said to you, do not hunt. The Sharia said to you what? Do not hunt whilst you're in the state of ihram. So this period of time, hunting has been made haram from you. Very good. Then the Sharia, the Sharia, what did it say? The Sharia, Allah wa Taala, what did he say to you? He said to you, go and hunt. وَإِذَا حَلَلْتُمْ فَاسْطَادُوا When you finish your state of ihram, Allah says, go hunt. There's an amr here. Can I say to you, al amr تَقْتَذِي wujub? No. This is the one the Sheikh is referring to. There's a dalil that diverted it from its what? This command diverted it from its obligation. It's not obligatory, nor is it istihbab. So now, some people say, and they get it wrong all the time, they say if something is prohibited in a short period of time, are you with me? It gets prohibited for a per short period of time, and then later it gets what? You get, Allah orders you to do it. We say it goes back to what it used to be. So sometimes that thing might have been a mustahab. Sometimes it used to be a mustahab. It goes back to istihbab. Sometimes it might be mubah. It goes back to mubah. It goes back to what it used to be. Now hunting on the other hand, uh, what we're talking about now, used to be what? Mubah. So it went back to ibaha. So no one can tell you that you have to hunt after you finish hajj. And say you have to hunt because Allah commanded you to do it. And the same is the ayah, Ya ayyaladheena amanu idha nudiya li salati min yawmil jum'ati fas'aw ila dhikri Allahi wa dharul bay' Thalikum khayru lakum in kuntum ta'alamun fa idha qudiyati salatu fantashiru you don't have to leave the masjid. You don't have to leave the masjid. Uh, and this is not amrun. It's not amr which shows obligation. Naam. Well, aslu fin nawahi anna halit tahrim illa ida dalla dalla ilu ala al karaha illa ida dalla dalilu illa ida dalla dalilu ala al karaha. Well, aslu fin nawahi the us the original essence of the prohibition in the kitab. And the Sunnah. So you always have to take it back to what? Wal-aslu fil-nawahi. The nawahi here is what? Fil-kitab wa sunnah. So if Allah and His Messenger prohibit something from you, what's the original essence of it? The asal is what? Annaha lit-tahrim. That is haram. That's the asal. That's the asal. The asal is that if Allah and His Messenger request from you to stay away from something, that this is haram. Then if you and me are arguing on a, or we're discussing a matter, I mean you are discussing a matter and we're discussing what you can do this uh, this is disliked and it's haram and i said to you Akhi, the prophet said it you can't do it he prohibited us from it and you say Akhi, this prohibition is lit karaha and i'm saying, on the other hand saying what it's it's tahrim you're saying it's disliked i'm saying to you, it's haram this prohibition here it's haram you're saying it is disliked it's not haram who needs to bring evidence 
my evidence is the asal. I am already, or I'm origin, I'm upon the original essence of what the prohibition shows. The prohibition it shows that it's haram. You now have to bring an external evidence to back your stance that this prohibition is what. That is lil karaha. That is dislike. That's what the sheikh is saying to you. While aslu fi nawahi, the original essence of prohibition is anha lil tahrimi that it's haram. Illa accept. إِذَا دَلَّ الدَّلِيلُ Unless there is an evidence that shows عَلَى الْكَرَاهَةِ That it's disliked. So there has to come a dalil that shows it. Now, example for a... Uh, what's the evidence for this, by the, for, by the way? That the asal of the prohibition, the asal of the prohibition is what? That it's haram is the ayah of Allah. وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ Anything he prohibits you from? Fantahu, stay away from it. That's the asal. You're not allowed to do it. It's haram for you to do it. Are you with me? Very good. Um, very good. Now, the question arises. Um, now the question that arises is what? Um, when can it turn away from the haram and then it becomes mubah? Sorry, when can it turn away from the haram, sorry, and become karaha, disliked? That this thing is a dislike. The example for that is what is narrated by Abu Dawood in his Sunan. The issue of prohibition of the dab, the lizard. And it's also narrated in what? It's also narrated in Bukhari and Muslim in Hadith Abdullah ibn Umar. That the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anna dabba ukila inda ma'idati rasulillah. That they ate a lizard in the presence of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while he was sitting with them. Um, The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he ate the, when he ate the uh, lizard, when they were eating the lizard, it was, some of the narration shows that he prohibited them from it. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, is it haram for us not to eat it? And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, no, you can eat it. He said, what? You can eat it. So the prohibition, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he stopped them from it, is the evidence for what? The evidence that, the, that is karaha, because he permitted it for them later. He permitted it for? For them later. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Naam. Wal aslu fil kalam al haqiqa fala yu'dalu bihi illa al majaz. Illa al majazi. Illa al majazi. In qulna bihi. The Sheikh now is talking about issue of what does a speech, um, what's the essence of a speech? Speech that comes out of a person's mouth, what's the asal? The asal of a speech that a person speaks is that it is literal. You take it at its literal meaning. If somebody says something to you, you take it at its what? You take, you take it at its asal. The asal is what? Al haqiqa. That it's what? It's literal. What does the word haqiqa mean? Haqiqa means هي اللفظ المستعمل. It is the word that is used في ما وضع له that which it's been placed for. Are you with me? Like the word lion, for example. The word lion, the way it was placed in the Arabic dictionary or to the Arabs, they know the lion as a what? حيوان مفترس. A animal that has claws, that kills. That's what they know it as. That preys on other animals, they know that as well. They know that as a lion. Very good. Majaz is what the Sheikh mentioned here. He said, first of all, before I move into that, Wal Aslu fil Kalami, the original essence of a person's speech is that haqiqa. Fala yu'dalu. Fala yu'dalu? You don't turn towards. Bihi ila al majaz. You don't turn towards majaz. In qulna bihi if we say it. Why did the Sheikh say that? That if, this, if there is something called al haqiqa and majaz and we're going to speak about that in a bit, inshallah ta'ala. إِلَّا إِذَا تَعَذَّرَتِ الْحَقِيقَةُ Unless the haqiqa is hard for us to take on board. That like it's impossible for us to say this. And I'm going to speak about this issue in a bit, inshallah ta'ala. Um, so pay attention here. Haqiqa, I said, is who he, it is what? هِيَ اللَّفْضُ الْمُسْتَعْمَلُ It's the word that is used 
that which has been placed for it. So the word lion, it's known as a haywanu muftaris. Good. The majazud, on the other hand, is what? Hiya lafudu, it is a word. Al musta'malu, that is used fi ghayri mawudi'alahu in opposite to what it was placed for. Like again, the word lion to be used as a what? To be used as a rajulun shuja' a brave man. That's majaz now. Because it's been used for what it wasn't placed for. That is called what? That's called a majaz. Metaphor, if you call it, or if it's a simile, whatever they say in English, that majaz is what is not literal. It is not. Naam. Um, this issue of dividing speech into haqiqa and majaz, to divide the speech into saying that this speech is haqiqa and this is majaz, this is something very well known and documented by who? It's documented by the latecomers, the people who came later, the mutaakhirin, the mutaqaddimin. The early generations, the Salaf of Hadi Al-Ummah, the pious predecessors, they never had something called majaz or haqiqah, never, not at all. So from within the scholars, there are those who said, لا majaz fi al So within the scholars, you find those who said, within the Qur'an, there's nothing called majaz, aslan. And this is the call of Ibn Khuwayz um, from the Malikiyah, Al-Zahiri, Ibn Al-Qas, who's from the Shafi'i, and other scholars from Ahlul Ilm. And some of them said there is no majaz in the Quran and not even other than the Quran. You won't find it in the Quran and you won't find it outside the Quran. And this is the speech, the view taken by who? And Abu Ishaq al Isfraini, the view taken by Abu Ali al Farisi, and, and other than them. And from the latecomers who took that view as well, as Sheikh Muhammad al Amin al Shaqiti. Muhammad al Amin al Shaqiti said that the Arabic language doesn't have no majaz and also the Quran doesn't have majaz. The Quran, all of it's haqiqah. And he has a book, powerful book. He argues serious on this matter. He called it Man Man Ujawaz al Majaz Fil Munazil al Ta'abud wal Ijaz. Also, that view was strengthened by Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah took that view that the Majaz also doesn't exist, nor in the Arabic language, nor in the Quran as well. Ibn al Qayyim also took that view that there's no such a thing. Rather, Ibn al Qayyim in his book, Mukhtasa Sawa'iq al Mursala, he says that the Majaz is a Tawut. The majaz is a tawut that the Ahlul Bid'ah used to go against Allah wa Ta'ala's characteristics and attributes. And their strongest arguments are as follows. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah says this usage of the word saying that this is haqiqah and this is majaz. He said this is um, istilahun hadith. It's a terminology that introduced itself later and it came after. بعد قرون المفضلة After noble generations. لم يتكلم به أحد من أئمة الصحابة ولا التابعين. Not any imams from the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and the Tabi'u Tabi'een. None of them used this word. حقيقة المجاز. حقيقة المجاز. None of them did. Rather, ولا أحد من أئمة اللغة العربية. And not even the علماء of this language, the Arabic language, and the grammarians. None of them said it. Such as خليل ابن أحمد الفراهيدي سيبويه الكسائي الفراء. Abu Ali, Abu, Abu Amr ibn al-Ala, Abu Zayd al-Ansari, al-Asma'i, Abu Amr al-Shaybani. And other than them, they never said that there's something called haqiqa and there's something called majaz. That's the argument that they put forward. And they went on to say that the, وَالْغَالِبُ أَنَّ الْمَجَازِ And the majority of those who have used the word majaz and haqiqa, they only came to use it, which are the Mu'tazila, they only came to use it and to make it a stepping stone or a ladder sulaman li nafi kathiri min sifati Allah ta'ala to negate Allah's characteristics subhanahu wa ta'ala by claiming what? bi annaha majaz that Allah's characteristics are metaphor wa hadha min a'zim wa sa'il al-ta'atil and that's one of their greatest means to negate Allah's characteristics so based on that the majaz is what? it is not something that our self of this ummah, the pious predecessors, the noble individuals, the ulama, ul muhaqqiqin, they didn't use that. They did not, did not use it. So, a statement which is very strong in the book, Daylu Tabaqat al Hanabila, in the third volume, page 140, 174 uh, to 175, he says, The scholars who, before I explain that part, the scholars they say, who say that there's no such thing as majaz. 
When it came to, for example, the arguments that were put forward was the ayah in the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, Jidar an yuridu an yanqadda fa'aqamah. Jidar, a Nabi Allah Musa and Khadir, they came to what? They came to a house owned by an orphan family, and their property and their wealth was showing because the building was about to collapse. So what did they do? They, Khadr stood up and he built their the house for them. The ayah says, Jidaran, a wall, yuridu, that wants. So to ascribe irada, want, to the wall, they said this is a metaphor. It's taking it from the human being, and uh, this characteristics of the human being, and giving it to the, to the wall. So they said this is not literal for the wall. Ibn Taymiyyah and other than him argued, Naam, the wall does have irada. And they brought, argue, they brought proofs such as when Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, uh, he, Allah's Messenger, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he cl climbed the mountain of Uhud and Uhud started to move. The Prophet hit his leg on the mountain of Uhud and he said, Uthbut ya Uhud, Uhud, stay still. Fa ma alayka nabi, a prophet is on you. Wa Siddiq, a truthful one. Wa shahidani, two martyrs are on you. Referring to Umar and Uthman. Two martyrs are standing on top of you. So if this mountain didn't have no hearing or want, then why would it move for in the first place? It moved because of the messenger going on top of it. Also, they are brought the argument which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the, the, ob the objects that are around us. He said, وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ There is nothing whatsoever. إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ وَلَكِنْ لَا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِحَهُمْ Everything around you, it exalts Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. It says the hamd, the, all of it. They remember Allah, they exalt Him as their master, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they said that this um, shows that the, the, the objects around us, they have a irada, and the irada can be attributed to it. This statement, and that's a powerful argument to put forward. Also, this, the other argument that they put forward, which is, if we said that the Qur'an has majaz, then they said it would mean that when somebody tells you, I saw a lion doing khutbah, Automatically, you're going to get rid of the word lion and dismantle it and get rid of it. And automatically, you're going to change the word into what? A brave person. So they said that what will happen to the Quran is you'd have to get rid of words. And say that this word has no importance because it's just a metaphor. And you'll change it to another word. And they said this is not something you can attribute to the Quran because every word in the Quran has its importance in the context. Oh, so... The question is that, the question is, they said that if somebody says to, so they said, okay, what about if I say to you, I saw a lion, ra'aytu asadan yakhtub. I saw a lion giving a khutbah. Where does this go? They said this is haqiqah in its meaning. Based on the statement I brought, فَاللَّفْضُ إِن دَلَّ بِنَفْسِي فَهُ حَقِيقًا If it shows a meaning in and within itself, like the, the word lion originally in its meaning, what does it show? حَيْوَانٌ مُفْتَرِسٌ So it's a haqiqah in and within itself here. And they said, now it's also haqiqah with the karina that you brought. So it's not a majaz. It is literal in its meaning now. That you literally saw a lion doing khutbah because this person and the lion, they have that in common. Bravery. Naam. So they said that the karina, huh, when it enters it, it also becomes a haqiqah in the other meaning. The same way it was haqiqah in and within its meaning. So... That is the view that was brought forward. Naam. The haqaiq are categorized into three types. The haqaiq are categorized into how many? Three types. Naam. They're categorized into three. The first one is haqiqatun shar'iyya. And the second one is haqiqatun lughawiyya. And the third one is Haqiqatun Urfiya. Let's go over each one. The first one is Haqiqatun Shar'iya. It means this word has a, 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 a legislational definition in its reality, what it means. And for example, it is like the word Salah. Salah, Salah, for us it means what? It's a ibadah, which you open with it by saying Allahu Akbar. There is a ruku', there is a sujood, there is a recitation of the Qur'an, there is adhkar. And it finishes with what? And it finishes with Salaamu Alaikum. So here, what is it? The word Salah has a, a, a shari meaning to it. It has a shari reality to it. 
So you can't use the word salah as the language-based meaning, which meant what? Ad-du'a. Even though some scholars, they said that the salah, linguistically, doesn't even mean du'a. That's another discussion, inshallah ta'ala. So salah, if we take it, according to those who say, that the word salah linguistically means du'a, we can't do that because it has a sharia reality to it. So that's called haqiqatul shar'iyya. The second one is called haqiqatul lughawiyya. This word has a, a, a linguistical reality to it. A language-based reality to it. And I gave you guys an example of one, which is a salah. In the language, it means a dua. If we take the view of those who say it is. The third type is al urfiya it, it, it has a custom. The custom of the people, it gave a meaning to this. And the custom of the people is of two types. The, 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 the urf, and the custom of the people is two types. That which is general and that which is specific. That which is general and that which is specific. That which is general is like the word dab. Dab differs from people to people based on their cultures. Some people, the word dab means for them what? Horses and camels. Today, for us, dab is like a car. So the word dab, it's a word based on the urf and the time changing. It has different to it. Are you with me? The urf, are you with me? The urf, which is khas, specific type, is called what? It is the one that used by a people of a field. The urf of the grammarians, when they say fa'il, is a grammatical point. When they say marfu', they have another meaning too. Don't go to the linguistic meaning. Go to their, their custom, then what they know it as. So for them, and I give you guys one, one, one thing that you guys can realize based on this one. The word sahih, according to the nuhat, what is it? Uh, sorry, according to the... Uh, According to the uh, muhaddithin, what is the word sahih? Sahih wa matasal isnad wa lam yushad da'aw yu'al yarwihi adun dhabitun amitrihi mu'tamadun fi tabtihi wa naqlihi. When sarfiyin say sahih, what do they mean? Sarfiyin, when they say sahih is kalimatun khallat, kalimatun fi usooliha khallat an ihda huruf al-illa. It's a letter that one of its, at, at its binya or its original essence, there isn't wawu alif wa ya in it. It's sahih. It's healthy from having any huruf al-illa in it. Like the word, like the word, for example, daraba. There's no harf illa in it. Whereas wa'ada has a harf illa in it. So wa'ada is what? Mu'tal. Daraba is sahih. So according to the sarfiyin, sahih means something because that's their urf. And according to the muhaddithin, the word sahih has a urf meaning for them. This is called khas. This is what? This is called khas. What's the fa'idah? What's the benefit for a student of knowledge to know the different types of the haqa'iq and how many they're categorized into? What's the benefit for them? The benefit that it has for us, inshallah ta'ala, is that we will take every word in, in, its rea in the meaning that it should be taken to. And we will place everything in the right place. So for example, if something has to be taken to the ling language-based meaning, we'll take it to the language-based meaning. And if it has to be taken to the sharia based meaning, we'll take it to the shari based meaning. And if something has to be taken back to the custom based meaning, we'll take it back to the custom based meaning. And that's how a student of knowledge will live good. And he wouldn't also what? He wouldn't also go against what Allah and His Messenger intend. So for example, when you look at the word, ashamsu wal qamar, are you looking, are you gonna look for that? Uh, are you gonna look for that within the sharia? Or does that go back to the language? What shams means, what qamar means, what layl means, what nahar means. It has its meaning based. When Allah wa Taala He said in the Quran, "Wa bil ma'roof," live with your wives in good. The Sharia didn't give any meaning to this. It said, "Live with your wives in good." Now, what is this good? In Africa, being married to a woman, living with her in good means that you give her five hundred dollars a month. Whereas in the UK, living with a woman in good means you give her two thousand pounds a weekend a month. So based upon that, based on that, and this is an example, of course, not a, uh, but approximately, so it differs. Each country has its different huh, amount that you have to give. And وَعَاشِرُوهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ تَخْتَلِفُ It differs from place to place. 
نعم وما حكم به ولم يحده اكتفاء بظهور ولم يه ولم يحده اكتفاء بظهور معناه معناه اللغوي وجب الرجوع فيه إلى اللغة anything that the sharia فما حكم به الشارع وحده أما أو ولم يحده أي with me وما حكم به ولم يحده اكتفاء بظهور معناه اللغوي وجب الرجوع فيه إلى إلى اللغة anything well you jump one فما حكم به الشارع you jump the line فما حكم به الشارع وحده 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 do a وحد put a شد everyone on the dal and put a a فتحة on top of the hat 